Hi everyone. For the next couple of episodes, we're going to be drilling down to some bedrock concepts of web performance, looking at some of the fundamental characteristics of how your code reaches your users. This time, it's all about latency, one of the most important yet misunderstood aspects of high-performing websites. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Lookahead for supporting this episode. The project we'll be working with started the way most of my side projects do. First I think of a funny name, then I buy the domain, then I forget about it, and then the second or third time that it comes up for a renewal, I decide that it's time to do something with it. I've got quite a few of these locked in step three, but I've recently pushed ahead with one of them and I realized it would make a quite a good use case for several topics I had planned. That project is called Pithy AF, and I conceived of it last year when I was reading a particularly entertaining book. I wanted a place to record bits of prose that I found satisfying, prose that was, well, pithy, like the Roger Ebert review I've been using. That idea morphed into a place where other people could record quotes and annotate them and share them and explore by author or work, that sort of thing. It's a pretty simple concept, but it has some nice properties that make it a good candidate for front-end setter episodes. At the moment, though, this is what it looks like. It's a completely static page with just a couple of quotes as placeholders, a bit of color, but nothing interactive. In the future, we'll have user accounts, submission forms, sharing buttons, routing, transitions, the whole lot. But for now, I just wanted to publish something so I could get some feedback on the design. It's currently online at v1.pithy.af, and we'll be publishing each stage like this as we go along. Obviously, you could throw a simple static site like this on any old hosting and it'd be fine. But it gives us an opportunity to discuss just what different hosting options would mean for performance. This is going to be the format for episodes using Pithy as an example. We'll take one small aspect or decision about building the site and dive way deeper than you would normally need to. It's a way to get that bedrock understanding of a topic but still tie it to a real world example. So let's get started. First up, let's consider what we're working with. We only have four files and they're all quite small, but it'll still be enough to see the impact of latency on performance. The good news is the work that we do now while the site is small will make more and more of an impact as it grows. Usually, people would expect that the time it takes to download something would be a direct function of the available bandwidth, and it does certainly make a big difference on larger files. But for smaller files, more bandwidth usually doesn't offer much of a speed up. In fact, for most of the assets on your average website, latency has a far greater impact. I've set up a couple of experiments to demonstrate just how much influence latency has. Let's consider a relatively small file, 100 kilobytes, downloaded over a fast connection of around 12 megabytes a second. In my testing, the median time to download that file from a server 15 milliseconds away was 70 milliseconds. It's pretty fast, but it works out to a download speed of only 1.5 megabytes a second. Nowhere close to maxing out a connection. Still, it's a small file, so it's not too bad. So what about another server halfway around the world? It takes 160 milliseconds for a single packet to travel there and back. Pretty fast considering how far it's traveling, but quite a long time for a computer and noticeable for a human. The question is, how long does that 100 kilobyte file now take to download? You might expect that you can simply add the transfer time we got before to the extra latency and get the new figure. After all, I'm pretty sure every connection between me and that server has plenty of bandwidth, so nothing should be slowing it down. Well, no. When I did this test, I measured 800 milliseconds, which is more than 10 times slower. Now we're only getting an effective speed of 125 kilobytes a second. How did that happen? How did an increase of latency of less than 150 milliseconds create a delay of over 700? A server roughly twice as far away turns out to take roughly twice as long. It seems like our download speed depends on how far away our server is, which is pretty unexpected. If you try the same test with a lot of files of different sizes, you can start to see a pattern. I ran this experiment on a local server here in Melbourne where I'm fetching files of up to 250 kilobytes from Sydney, San Jose, and London the same three locations as the previous example. For files from Sydney, the download time grows slowly and steadily with the size of that file, and since we have plenty of bandwidth, it's all really fast. However, for San Jose and London, the time increases in these big discrete steps. If you look closely, you'll see that each step goes up at roughly the same amount as the latency to that server, 160 milliseconds for San Jose and 280 for London, which gives us a clue as to what's happening. For some reason, as the files get bigger, at certain points, we start incurring extra delays of one round trip. What we're observing is one of the fundamental characteristics of TCP, the network protocol that allows HTTP, and by extension the web as we know it, to work. It's how your computer and the servers hosting your website communicate and transmit files to each other. And while it usually works so well you don't have to know much about it, it's worth taking a, just a brief moment to look at how it works and how this behavior arises. The main thing you need to understand about TCP is that it's designed for reliability. It's designed to get the bytes to their destination in the right order with a guarantee that there's no errors. 
It manages this by having your computer constantly replying to the server to say everything's okay, a process known as acknowledgement. It works even over unreliable or congested connections and does so in a way that doesn't overload any of the intermediate networks between you and the server. It's an incredibly successful design and it's the reason that we as web developers don't have to worry about our files going missing or being corrupted as they're sent. Arguably, it's the reason we even have a web to develop. It's this last point that causes the behavior we saw before. Let's look at how. The super simplified version is this. Your computer, after the initial greeting, asks for some data. The server responds by sending the first bit and then you tell the server that you got it okay. Then the server sends some more, you acknowledge that too, and the process continues until you've got it all. I'm glossing over a bunch of complexity, but the key point here is that the total time to send this file is heavily dependent on how many back and forths you need, particularly if your computer and the server are far apart. So you want to maximize the amount of data you send each time, but that brings us to a problem. How do you know how much data is safe to send? Well, if at one stage the data gets lost for some reason, or the acknowledgement doesn't get through, the server will try sending that chunk again. It's one of the ways that TCP can guarantee that things eventually will be delivered. But if it's actually that the network is just too slow or congested to handle that amount at one time, the network can totally break down. The server continually retries, and so does everyone else using the network, and suddenly nobody can get anything through. It's for this reason that TCP connections start slow, first sending down a small amount and making sure it gets through OK. If all goes well, the next round trip will return more data, what's known as the window size increasing. If a problem is detected, a packet is dropped or a transmission times out, the window size decreases again to make sure we don't overload the system. It's for this reason that mobile networks or sketchy Wi-Fi can feel so slow. You need a series of round trips without interruption for the connection to build up speed, and that's less and less likely as your wireless signal gets weaker. Now, this doesn't happen for every new file. Once a TCP connection is established, you can use it to make multiple HTTP requests. But it does mean that the effective latency is most pronounced right at the beginning of a user's visit. Of course, that's also the moment when he or she is deciding whether to bother waiting for your site to load, so it's extremely important. Now, if we look at that graph again, it should all make sense. Every time the response time increases, it's because of another round trip. But those steps get further apart because the TCP windows are increasing each time. The window sizes are hard to predict ahead of time. They depend on the browser, the server, and the network equipment in between, not to mention the amount of congestion on the network at that moment. But modern browsers tend to start the process by setting the initial window size to 14 kilobytes, which is why that graph is flat for the first 14 kilobytes. Any file smaller than that will arrive in the first round trip. This is why you might hear that number mentioned in performance recommendations, and while you often see tools that inline things like CSS or small images into the HTML. That way, even though you're sending the same amount of data, with more things in that initial window, things appear much faster. That's particularly important for slow or unreliable connections. Sometimes it can be a struggle to even get 14 kilobytes down to a user. We'll be putting that into practice for Pithy in the future, however, today I want to keep our focus on how we're hosting our code, not what we're hosting. When it comes to latency, where you host your code is really the controlling factor. While light in a vacuum could loop around the surface of the Earth in 130 milliseconds, light in an optical fiber travels about 30% slower. Also, there's often not a direct path between two points, and every piece of network hardware in between adds its own delay. Add to that the fact that a round trip requires both an outward and return journey, and you can see why latencies of 3, 4, or 500 milliseconds are quite common. A good service to get an idea of latency figures between you and a few locations around the world is cloudping.info. It's not particularly scientific, but it does let you look at multiple locations at once, which can be useful. Here, you can see what being an internet user in Melbourne is like. Anywhere but Sydney is a long, long way away. Of course, assuming that your audience is scattered all around the world, how do you choose where to host it? That is, assuming that your hosting provider even gives you a choice. Most static site hosts don't. Well, that's where a CDN like CloudFront or CloudFlare comes in. Firstly, they have a lot more locations, so you're more likely to be reaching a user from a server nearby. And secondly, each of those locations hosts their own cache. That means for most or even all the assets on your site, your users don't have to communicate with your server at all, and it suddenly becomes a lot less important where it's hosted. CDNs work by intercepting requests for your site, returning either a different IP address, depending on where the request is coming from, or a single IP address that resolves to the closest server. It's a fairly complex process, and it's not perfectly reliable. Sometimes a user will get routed to a server further away than necessary, particularly if you're using one of the free plans. But getting comfortable with placing a CDN between your server and your users means that as your site grows, you can upgrade the providers and performance of your site without having to change its architecture. 
I want to finish today by demonstrating the impact that adding a CDN like Cloudflare can have, using a really handy tool at performance.sakori.net for this. I've set up V1 Direct as an alias to V1, but without Cloudflare enabled. It's hosted on Heroku, which is in Virginia in the US, so the latency to the US and Europe is pretty good. The connection column is reporting latency, and we can see that New York is pretty close, only 25 milliseconds away. And places like London, Amsterdam, Toronto, and Sao Paulo are around 100 milliseconds, which is pretty good. Singapore, Sydney, and Los Angeles are starting to get really quite slow, and Bangalore really suffers. Note that because we're transmitting such a small amount of data, this tool has still judged us very kindly and given us an A+. But if we continue to host in just the one place, we can expect that to plummet fairly quickly as the site grows. Now if we try the version with Cloudflare enabled, we can see just what a huge difference it makes. 10 of the locations now have a latency lower than 15 milliseconds, which is incredibly fast. And our worst case, Bangalore, has dropped from over 700 milliseconds to just over 50. That's effectively making a site that was slow to the point of inaccessibility now totally usable. I do recommend using Cloudflare because it's quite easy to use and the free plan is usually more than enough for most side projects. It means you can pretty much choose whichever host you're most comfortable using as long as both Cloudflare and the host are set up correctly. That's going to be the topic of the next episode as we look at the HTTP headers that allow your server to control the behavior of the CDN so that everything performs just right. Thanks for watching. Just quickly before you go, I'd like to thank Look Ahead again for making this episode available. They hire software engineers and CTOs in Australia and are particularly involved in the JavaScript and React communities. They're a small team and I've known them all for years. They're literally the only tech recruiters in Australia I'd recommend and I can't recommend them highly enough. If you're new to the channel, Front End Center is a subscription screencast series for web professionals. If you'd like to support the channel and see the full collection, including the sequel to this episode, head over to frontend.center and subscribe. Or subscribe here on YouTube to get notified whenever more free episodes are released.